Hey everyone, my name is John Dupin and this is my wife, Tammy Dupin. Yeah, thank you for joining us for today's teaching. Yeah, we hope it inspires you, encourages you, and builds up your faith. Yeah, so let's jump in. How are we feeling today? How are we feeling? Yes. Okay, okay. 25 year one. We started this series last week because we know that God has a 25 year initiative ahead of us. And this is year one which means we need to take steps in it right now. We need to help understand what does it mean to be a culture that thinks not just one week ahead of us, but thinks a generation ahead of us. And last week we started to unpack that and look at that. Uh, We're gonna continue that today. If you wanna look ahead, we're gonna be in Numbers chapter 20 and Deuteronomy chapter 32 and 33, and we're gonna end in 2 Corinthians. So we're gonna be kind of all over the place. I want you to think for just a second about something, something that has never disappointed you, okay? And I'll give you an example in my own life, M&Ms. Never, I've never had a bad M&M. Yes, sir. Come on, yes. Look, I, you guys get vocal when we start talking about candy. I've never had a, I mean, I, I, try, I racked my brain. I thought about every birthday party, I thought about every, a uh, 7-Eleven that I've been to, I thought about every, and I've never had a handful of M&Ms that were bad. Um, some other things in my life, uh, Toy Story movies. You think they can't do it again. You go to Toy Story 2 and, and you're just like, I'm crying again. And then Toy Story 3, okay, this is it. They're not gonna do it again. And then, oh my goodness, they're, they're, they're all holding hands as they're going down into the trash compactor. And, and I look over at my kids and they're fine. I'm crying. And then I think, that's it, just stop. Don't make any more movies. And then they do Toy Story 4. And I'm like, no, they're they're gonna ruin this. They're gonna ruin this. I I didn't even go with my kids. I went by myself and watched it. No, I'm just kidding. And it was amazing. Toy Story's never disappointed me. Now, I know there's a prequel. Somebody says something about that, but I don't know about that. But, you know, let's just just stay with those four right there. But what is something that's that's never disappointed you? Um, Then I want you to shift for a second. I I, I wanna go to, to something else. Something that is increasingly disappointing you. And, and I think the low-hanging fruit on this is airlines. Can, can we just, can we have a moment for a second? And I know this is like almost cliche now. It's almost cliche to, to, to talk about the airlines. You know, you walk up with your, your, you know, your check-in baggage and they're just like, which one of these do you want to pay to be lost? You get to choose. Well, I don't wanna lose either one of them. No, you've gotta choose one. Uh, okay, that one. Okay, that'll be $50. You're gonna charge me to lose my back? Yes, you're welcome. And, and then you're, you're just flying from Lynchburg to Charlotte and they reroute you to Saudi Arabia. <laughs> and you're like, how did, what, I, I'm, I'm three days into this flight. Are you kidding me? And then you have that backpack you know, on, your, on, your, on your back and they're like, would you like to check that in? No, these are my camping supplies because I know I'm gonna be here <laughs> for a while. And, and what happens when we, we get increasingly disappointed? We start to get angry, and then anger turns to bitterness. And when bitterness calcify, it becomes something that I believe is prevalent in our culture today, and it's called contempt. Contempt, it's malice. It is where you start to look at someone or a group of people, and there's nothing they can do. In fact, the very air that they breathe you have contempt for them. And I want us to look at that today because that is going to answer a question that I want to grapple with in 25 year one. What will diminish the effectiveness and shorten the assignment of a legacy generation? Legacy generation, that's generation one and two. Generation one and two, and that is present today in this room. Generation one and two, legacy generation. What will diminish our effectiveness and shorten our assignment for generation three and four? And and that is unresolved contempt and disappointment. And we're gonna look at this in the life of Moses. So here's what's happening in Numbers chapter 20. There's really three sections of Moses' life. There's the first 40 years in Egypt. If you saw the Prince of Egypt, if you've read the book of Exodus, you know this story. Uh, There is the middle section where he 
he goes off into, into the, as a shepherd in, in Midian, and, and he lives as a shepherd, and he starts to build his family there. And then at the age of 80, he sees the burning bush that calls him to lead God's people, to set them free, and lead them towards the promised land. And we're getting now to the end of that 40 years. Now, you remember, if you, if you know the story, and if you don't know the story, I'm going to catch you up here, that it was only supposed to take 40 days-ish to get from Egypt to the promised land. It took them 40 years because the legacy generation, the ex-slave generation, the generation that left Egypt, they, they, of course, lost faith in God's provision and they rebelled against their leaders and God said, okay, well, then you guys are going to have to die here in the wilderness and it'll be the emerging generation, it'll be generation three and four that inhabits the promised land. So generation three and four were born in the wilderness and they had to watch the legacy generation, generation one and two, die in the wilderness before they could go cross the Jordan and into the promised land. Moses, in the meantime, is leading this group of people and for 40 years, he has dealt with complaining and insults and rebellions that have risen up. He has dealt with coming down off of the mountain and there worshiping a golden calf and breaking the Ten Commandments and on and on. He's dealt with the loneliness of leadership of no one understanding the weight that he carries and then have to mediate between this people and God and sometimes even negotiate on their behalf so God doesn't incinerate them. And this is Moses. And we get to this place, it's coming towards the end of the 40 years, his sister Miriam dies. And this is a really sad moment for Moses because if you know the story of Moses, it was his sister who actually put him in the basket, right, and sent him down the river and saved his life. And it was his sister that was there when, when, when they crossed the, the Red Sea and she composed this song that became renowned among the people. And, and it was a complicated relationship, but he loved his sister and she has just died and some things have happened and we're going to look into this story and we're gonna to get to a point and you're gonna be able to identify with where Moses is at this time. So let's jump into this, this verse in Numbers chapter 20. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, this happened all the time. M Moses is getting instructions from Yahweh, okay? Take the staff, remember the staff. Staff's always been a part of Moses' journey. It's, it's, I could get into a whole thing there, but he says, take the staff and assemble the congregation you and Aaron and your uh, you and, and and Aaron your brother. So they're going to do what they've been doing and tell the rock. I want you to say this with me. One, two, three. Tell the rock. What does that mean? It means speak to it. Speak to it. Tell the rock before their eyes to yield its waters or its water. So you shall bring water out of the rock for them and give drink to the congregation and their cattle, because they need it, right? So, so far, so good. Uh, Moses and Aaron, they're, they're still grieving the loss of their sister, and, and, and things are kind of complicated between the two of them, but they love each other, right? It's family. Yeah, okay, you can feel that, you can feel that, okay? So what happens? Then Moses and Aaron gather the assembly together before the rock. So far, so good. And he, Moses, said to them, hear now, you rebels. Okay, what just happened? Everything was going great. They're following instructions. And Moses assembles the congregation, and something that has been lingering and brewing inside finally comes out and he says to generation three and four, you rebels, you ungrateful, lying, conniving, rebellious, on and on and on in that one statement. 
you rebels. Something is coming out of Moses here, and it's been brewing. Shall we bring water for you out of this rock? He asked them a question. It's a rhetorical question because he's getting ready to do something. He's getting ready to express something. Look what it says next. It says, and Moses lifted up his hand, remember the staff, and struck the rock. What did he do? He struck the rock. He didn't tell the rock, he struck the rock. Some of you know this story. He struck the rock, not once, but twice. Now, a lot of rabbis and a lot of scholars have debated over this, why did he, why did he hit it twice? And, and some of them, and I don't know if this is true or not, but, but for, for, for the sake of, of just introducing this idea, some believe that he struck it twice, once for his contempt for the people, and twice for his contempt for the Lord. Moses was angry, and he couldn't take it anymore. He couldn't take it anymore. He was disappointed, and disappointment turned into anger, and he didn't resolve it there, and it turned into bitterness. He was bitter, towards these people, he was bitter towards God. His heart had calcified into contempt. And water came out abundantly. God does what he says he's gonna do either way. And the congregation drank and their livestock. Here's what we're gonna see. Unresolved contempt and disappointment will manifest themselves outwardly. Eventually, it's going to come out. And you know that in your life, I know that in my life. It comes out and it manifests outwardly with different people based upon their experience, based upon their personality type, based upon how they're wired, but it still comes out. You and I both know when we're around somebody and these people are in our family and maybe even in our house where the contempt for God, the contempt for people, the contempt for oxygen breathers is so palpable. It is so visible. You can hear it in the way they speak. You can hear it in what they don't say. And sometimes we hear it from other people when they recognize it in us. Someone is brave enough to say, Hey, man, are you okay? Are you okay? What do you mean, am I okay? You just seem, you just seem off. There's something inside. What happens when we do not resolve contempt and disappointment? What happens when we let it calcify in our heart and our soul we start to view God and the things of God and what God has done for us and the assignment that he has put us on through the lens of malice, of hate, of resentment, and through those lenses, we become more and more ineffective. And that's exactly what happens to Moses here. A shift happens that no one saw coming. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe in me to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel. What does that mean? Because remember, Moses and Aaron are, are the, in, they're the in-between. They're the, they're the priests, if you will. They're the prophets, if you will. And what God is saying here is, Moses, you showed up with your contempt to represent me. Oh. How often does that happen in homes of church-going folk? Mom and dad got their feelings hurt by one another, by the church, by a spiritual leader. They got wounded 
something happen along the way, a group of people or a person. And that contempt and that disappointment is palpable in that home. And oh, they're having devotions. But man, it's, it's just weird. And oh, they're taking the kids to church. Get that tie straight. We're going to church and you're going to be happy. Get that hair down. Come on. Jesus loves you. <laughs> Mommy, what's, what's wrong? You, I mean nothing. <laughs> right? So what do, we, what, do we, what do we need to grapple with? And this is this. If we're going to finish well, if we're going to finish the assignment that God has given us, we have to realize something. The elder generation must continue in, continuously resolve contempt and disappointment to remain effective and finish well. Let's go back to that verse for just a second because I want to see one of the saddest moments here. It says, therefore, you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. Right there, Moses, for 120 some years of his, or 100 plus years of his life, has listened and obeyed the Lord. But somewhere along the way, he stopped forgiving. He stopped, he stopped giving that stuff in his heart to the Lord, that anger, that resentment. Okay, Lord, I'm... I'm in a bad place, Lord. I just, I just ask that you take this from me. Take this from me. So that I can have a lens to lead these people. And in that moment, the Lord says to Moses, Moses, you're still my man. But you need to know that your assignment to lead these people has been completed. Hmm. Why? Because, and rabbis and scholars on either side of this debate. They talk about this, but some just believe that in that moment, Moses' heart was just so contemptuous that the Lord knew that he would not be the voice. He could not be the voice on the other side of that river. And I don't know about you, but I, I don't wanna ever get to that place where God has this assignment for me and he says, you know what? I'm just gonna have to set you to the side so that someone else can finish it. Because there's things that you and I need to talk about. So I wanna go back to this point again because if we're gonna, if we're gonna go 25 year one, two, three, 25 year 25 and see the emerging generation take this further and faster than we ever, we gotta get a hold of this again. The elder generation, that's generation one and two, right here in the room. The elder generation must continuously resolve contempt and disappointment to remain effective and finish well. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 32. I, I, I wanna get to some solutions here. But first I wanna talk about, if you are here today and you want to grow in your contempt and your disappointment. So in other words, if you're like, you know what, I wanna try this out. I'm gonna give you three ways you can do that. And then I'm gonna give you a bonus, okay? So, here's how you grow contemptuous and disappointed. Believe that we deserve to have our dreams fulfilled. Believe that we deserve it. Now, let's talk about this for a second. All of us have dreams for our life, right? We have talents and skills. I mean. We started to recognize these early on in our life and we started to dream these dreams about what our life was gonna be like and, and it was gonna be big and it was gonna be important and I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do that. And along the way though, some of that potential that we, we thought that we had, we recognized got, got right-sized. We, we had dreams for what our relationships were gonna look like, what our marriage was going to look like. You know, I'm gonna marry a Christian girl from a Christian school or whatever, or from my church, and 
or a Christian man and we're going to get married and we're going to have a princess moment at my wedding. And everybody's going to see the pictures and then we're going to be happily ever after and then what happens? You get home from the honeymoon and he doesn't pick up his clothes, right? And she snores. What? And that's, man, that's just, that's just the beginning, right? Disappointment in the marriage and, and then, oh, you have children and, and, and your children are going to live out what maybe you left on the table, Right? Mommy, I don't want to go to gymnastics. You are going to win a gold medal. <laughs> we have these dreams for our kids, and, and, and what happens along the way is we get disappointed because a lot of these things don't come to fruition. We didn't get the job that we thought that we, we got the degree, right? We went and got the degree, and, and then we got the other degree to help with the first degree, and and every time people just say, hey, you might want to try something different. Yeah, but I got this degree and this thing. And yeah, yeah, you're not good at it. Can, can we just be honest with you? But I got a degree. Next. Demand influence without investment or adjustments. Generation one and two, if you want to grow in your contempt and disappointment, demand influence from generation three and four without any investment whatsoever. Just walk up to a, a 20-year-old and say, let me tell you something about how messed up your life is. They are ready, they are ripe to hear from you and your decades of wisdom that you've been able to kind of pull together? Of course not. I mean, we laugh at it, but this happens. And we find ourselves sometimes filibustering at, li at the line in Chick-fil-A to some young college students about what's wrong with their generation. And finally, the 22-year-old Girl and boy, they're in front of you, are like, um, sir, um, I think it's your turn to order now. Demand influence without investment. Even your children, right? Like, don't foster connections with them. What, what's something that, that we say? Finish this sentence. Because I... Oh, it was hard to say, wasn't it? Because we know how hard it was for us to hear, and yet we say it. We say it to our two and three-year-olds, but then we also say it to our 20 and 30-year-olds. Is it uncomfortable in here? Okay, yes, yes. Thank you, Jay. We think that we because we are now in our 40s and beyond, that we are owed influence without investment or adjustments. Adjustments, what does that mean? That means that we talk to generation three and four different than we talk to generation one and two. We talk differently to three and four than we do our peers or even our elders. Why? Because they change over time. We get older, but 18-year-olds stay 18, right? They get the, the same 18-year-old coming up is going to have an 18-year-old mind just like the generation before. So, demand it. What's next? This is number three, and then I've got a bonus, okay? Resent our past failures, Resent our past failures. We've, we've all failed. We failed big time at things. And so if you want to grow contemptuous and disappointed, just resent them. Resent, resent those failures. And act like you and, and, and 
that you should be the exception, that you should, you should live this life where there's no failing at all. Um, resent poor choices. We've made poor choices. There, there's been times in our life where we're just like, you know what, I'm, I'm gonna choose this and I'm gonna go after this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go after this business and I'm gonna, I'm gonna invest in this thing. And, and all of a sudden we realize that it was not a good investment and it, and it failed, it failed. And we, we, we failed at it or we made a poor choice. And, and so what we do, if we wanna grow contemptuous and disappointed and we wanna, and we wanna keep those things to calcify our heart and our soul and, and to lose to lose effectiveness and to shorten our assignment, then just resent them. Resent them and and try to spin them and act like they didn't happen instead of learn from them. And then of course, painful trials. No one on planet Earth gets an exception to grief, to despair. No one. And what we try to do, though, is we try to look at other people's trials and compare ours to theirs. And, and if we want to grow contemptuous and disappointed, then, then just resent all of this. And, and, then, and then channel it towards people and then channel it towards God. God, you, you it's your fault, God. All this is your fault. Man, and you are on the highway to contempt. Now, I promised you a bonus, okay? So here's a bonus for those of you who like bonus, and that is this, make friends with contemptuous and disappointed people. There's your bonus. If you find yourself not being contemptuous and disappointed, just make friends with people who are. Hey, how much cable news do you watch? Oh, good, can I hang out with you? Just hang out with them. I'm telling you, you you walk in the room and you are like hopeful and you are garnering influence with the emerging generation because you're investing in them and you're and, and you're you're spending time with them and you're and, and, and then all of a sudden you walk in and, you, and you're like, okay, I think I want to be friends with these people. And within five minutes, you start to go, yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe it all is fatal and and worthless and hell in a handbasket. Just make friends with them. Now, here's the problem, and here's the problem, and we're gonna see the solution here. Unresolved contempt and disappointment will diminish our effectiveness and shorten our assignment. Now, did Jesus still die on a cross for our sins, past, present, and future? Absolutely. Did he still raise again on the third day? And if we believe in him, his spirit is in us, and we will inherit his eternal family, and we will reap the, the, the image bearing of God here and now and forever, absolutely 100%. But man, I don't wanna leave anything on the table. I don't wanna leave one well done on the table because I was too proud or too afraid or too lazy to grapple with resentment, and anger, and bitterness, and contempt, and disappointment. I don't wanna leave anything on the table. So, what happens? So, three times, Moses goes to God and says, hey, I'm sorry, would you reconsider? And God's like, we're good, no. Uh, Okay, one more time. I'm sorry, I'm sorry that I did. I know I disobeyed you and that was not good. Hey, we're good, we're good, we're good, yeah, but no, I'm not reconsidering it. Now, there was another person, well, we'll get to that. So, Numbers chapter 32, here's what Moses decides. He has resolved the fact that he and God are good and that God is going to show him, he's going to give him a preview of the promised land, even though he cannot lead the people into it. He decides to do something, and it's something that I think we need to do starting today and in year one, so that we are people who are constantly taking inventory 
of the things that are going bump in our heart. He does something. Verse 1, Deuteronomy 32. What do, what do we see here? Let's, let's look at this. This is, this is big. I will proclaim, this is verse 3, sorry. I will proclaim the name of the Lord. Oh, praise the greatness of our God. Oh, come on, come on, somebody got it, somebody got it, somebody got it. Okay, okay, what's, what's happening here, what's happening here? It, it, we just did it 25, 30 minutes ago. When we get locked up in something, we praise our way out of it. We praise our way out of it. And, 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 and Moses knew this, Moses knew this. He said, oh man, I am going to have to, to deal with the consequences of my sin God and I are good, but I still got to live with this. And you know what? Sitting right here and up here, all of us have that story. We sinned, and nothing humanly is going to change the consequences of that sin in this reality. People are good with us, or at least a lot of them are. Some of them aren't, but we're still going to have to live out the consequences of that. Fill in the blank for you. Poor choices. Right? Failures. Fill in the blank. Fill in the blank. Fill in the blank. But, but here's, what, here's what Moses does here. He proclaims the name of the Lord and he composes Deuteronomy chapter 32, which in the Hebrew Bible is one of the most prolific hymns published in the Pentateuch and through the rest of the Old Testament. I mean, take some time and just dissect this. Verse four, look what he says. He says this, he says, he is the rock. His works are perfect. What is Moses doing? He's preaching to himself. He's going back and he's, he's, he's pulling back these memories of how he was this little baby saved. In the re- Come on, woo! He's saying, he is the rock. His works are perfect, and all his ways are just. I don't always get it, but it's just. A faithful God. When I am not faithful, I know that he is. When the people are not faithful, I know that he is. A faithful God who does no wrong, upright, and just he is. Why do we sing these songs? Why do we ask grown men, grown men with trucks and John Deere hats to stand up and lift their hands and say, oh, I should be dead. I've made some poor choices. I failed at some things. I have felt despair like no man, but I praise the Lord. I praise the Lord. When did I start to forget? When did I start to forget it? You do miracles. Oh, let me not forget. But he doesn't stop there. He goes on and on and on. In verse 45, he gets to the very end of that, and he says, Moses came with Joshua. Who, his, who will be his successor, son of none, and spoke all these words of this song in the hearing of the people, in the hearing of the people. This isn't for his private journal, it's for the people. When Moses finished reciting all these words to all Israel, look what it says, look what it says. It says, he said to them, take to heart all these words I have solemnly declared to this day to this day, so that you may command your children to obey carefully all the words of this law. These are not just idle words for you. They are your life. By them, you will live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to possess. 
Moses commands his soul to deal with his contempt and his disappointment and praise the Lord. And he tells the people, learn from me, learn from me and praise the Lord. Praise the Lord and you will live long in the land by the law of the Lord. What are we gonna do? 25 year one. We gotta do this and this is, this is how we build a finish well culture. So, so write this down, write this down. Remember the story of God in our lives and share it with those we influence. I'm telling you, I'm, I get it, I get it. Some of you didn't grow up singing songs, and some of you didn't grow up coming forward to respond and ask for prayer. I get it, I understand that. It wasn't part of your tradition, or maybe you didn't go to church growing up. Let me tell you something. There is intentionality to all of it, and it's so much bigger than you and me. There is a generation watching and saying, show me how to live well and finish well. Well, let me show you. Start by humbling yourself and sharing how God has taken your past failures, your poor choices, and the suffering of your life, and how he has made it a beautiful testimony of his grace and goodness. Whew, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. Now, I want to get to this last one here because I think it's important. If you flip the page, Deuteronomy 33, this, this is the hardest thing that I think Moses had to do at this moment in his life, okay? Verse 33, or chapter 33, verse one. This is the blessing that Moses, the man of God, the man of God pronounced on the Israelites before his death. What? What do you say? Why, why, why was this one of the hardest things they had to do? This was a group of people that in Numbers chapter 20, he says, I can't stand you anymore. You people, you rebels, you are driving me crazy. I hate you. Now here's some water. Come get your chicken nuggets. Right? Man, we get there, don't we? Whew. And so what does he do? He starts vertically. I praise you, Lord. I remember everything you do, and I'm gonna share it with the people. And okay, Lord, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it. I'm going to bless them. And you know what he does? He goes tribe by tribe. And he says, Judah. Issachar, you are. And he speaks divine destiny over them. You want to know how to love your enemies the way Jesus teaches us to love our enemies, to get us out of calcification of our soul? Bless your enemies. Bless those who curse you, who despitefully use and abuse you. And something happens. We obligate God to transform our souls. Oh, don't miss that. Yeah, come on, come on, come on, come on. Don't miss that, don't miss that. Because Tammy was up here earlier and she says, I pray for that woman who is lonely. I pray for that man who just came because somebody, somebody made him come. I, I believe there's something in it for all of us, but I believe God is speaking to you. Look, look, look what it says. Jump down the very end. It says, blessed are you, Israel, who is like you, a people saved by the Lord. He is your shield and helper and your glorious sword. Your enemies will cower before you and you will tread on their, man, look at this. This is the man who just had said, I can't stand you people. He is now saying, the Lord bless you and so do I. You have a divine destiny and I call it out of you. Can you imagine if generation one and two, we got over our anger and our bitterness and our broken dreams 
and are deserving this and are deserving that. And we turned all that over to praise and we turned it all over to blessing the emerging generation. What would happen in this church? What would happen to generation three and four coming up behind us? They would go off into their schools into their universities and colleges, into their future marriages, carrying the torch of the gospel like no generation before them. Sign me up, y'all. You can lose both of these bags if you want to. I'm just glad that you're here. I hope and pray that our pilots are awake and alert. If they're not and we crash and we die, I hope I see you in heaven. And if you don't know Jesus, hang on, y'all. Let me tell you about Jesus Christ crucified and resurrected. You want to get baptized? There's a water fountain right over there. (laughs) Can you imagine those people in the airport? All right, let's finish this up. Stand with me. I want to read this over us. Second Corinthians. This is written by a man who asked three times that God would take something painful from him. I'm going to ask the Waymaker Worship. They'll just join me up here and we'll get, we'll get ready for this. And the Lord said three times to the Apostle Paul, nope, I'm not going to take this from you. I'm not going to take this pain from you. I'm not going to take this trial from you. What, we don't know what it was. But he, just say, he does say this. My grace is sufficient for you. My grace, my endless, eternal grace is sufficient for you. It will take care of you in this. It's a no on that. No, I'm not taking it away from you. It's a yes on my grace. And this is what Paul says right after that. He says, that is why, for Christ's sake, Christ, Jesus, the new and greater Moses, what Moses was not able to do, Christ fulfilled. I delight in weakness, in insult, in hardships, in persecution, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I'm strong. Can you imagine if a generation of men and women who are pursuing after the Lord, who are spirit-filled, who have their hands open, and their hearts full to do the work of Jesus in a lost and dying world, if they got a hold of that, unstoppable, unstoppable. And so I just want us to pray over these three three things. Just bow your heads right now. So uh, I'm just gonna, these these are applications that we're just gonna, we're gonna gonna pray. Speak more vulnerably than you think you should. Just say, Lord, what, what, what are some, What are some failures and some choices I just need to tell people about? Maybe you're 30 years clean and sober and you've not told anybody that outside of your AA meeting. And and you know it was the Lord. Speak more vulnerably than you think you should. And then this is what I want you to pray. And then double it. Just, just get to the edge of whatever you think, right? Man, I don't know if I want to share that. I don't know if that's just really, you just get to the edge of that and say, okay, I think this is, and then double it, and then double it. Because I'm telling you, there's a generation that needs to hear about how your marriage almost fell apart, but how Jesus made your weakness strength. Next, bless more than you think you should. Bless more than you think you should. I, I get it. We need, to, we need to correct and we need to guide and we need to coach our children and, and our grandchildren. I get that. I, we, we need to do that. But what if we bless them even more than we corrected them? What, what if we bless them? What if we spoke the divine destiny? So just pray this over. Bless more than you think you should, then 
get, get to the edge of that, get to the edge of that. Just like, I'm, I think if I bless them, eat more than this, I'm gonna spoil them. I'm gonna ruin them. If I speak too much life, too much encouragement, too much divine destiny into them. I'm gonna, okay, get to the edge of that, get to the edge of that, get to the edge of that, and then triple it. Yeah, so somebody got a hold of it, triple it. Just, just, just get crazy with blessing. The very people who drive you crazy the most. I bless you, I bless you. Let me tell you something. The Lord has a destiny on you and I'm praying for it every day, every day, every day. Okay, finally, this is it, this is it. Praise the Lord more than you think you should. Man, I am in the suburbs of central Virginia, farmland, pretty houses and pretty people. And man, I don't know, I don't know, man, that might just get a little crazy for me to praise the Lord more than I think I should. I might, I might, I might actually move a little bit. I might actually groove a little bit. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know if I can do that. Listen, what, what would happen if you just praise the Lord more than you think and you quadrupled it? You quadrupled it. You quadrupled it. I saw Timothy come up here in the second service uh, last week, and he just started dancing before the Lord. And I knew it. I knew what some people thought. Oh, man, isn't that beautiful? Isn't that cool? He's, un he's unrestricted. And some people are like, man, that's just weird. I don't know if I could do that. What if you could, though? What if God said, I want, I, I want you to praise me more than you think you should and I want you to quadruple it. What would happen to your mind and heart? What would happen to all that unforgiveness? What would happen to all that disdain and all that resentment and all that guilt? It's just locked up in there. Whew. Thank you so much for joining the Waymaker Church YouTube channel. We hope this video encouraged your faith and brought you to the new and deeper with Jesus Christ. If you enjoyed this video, you can join us live every Sunday on YouTube, Facebook, and Church Online. Uh, you can also subscribe by hitting the button below. You can keep up with everything going on here at Waymaker Church YouTube channel. And if you enjoyed this video, share it with people that you know. It isn't about making our name known, but about making the name of Jesus known any way we can. If you would like to partner with us also financially and help the vision that God has for Waymaker Church, you can go to waymaker.church slash give and help fund everything that's going on here. Again, thank you for joining us today. Now go make a way.